Early on, we came across these like commercials that were from Thailand. Remember those? And they were like they were like laundry detergent commercials <laughs> from Thailand, but they were so emotional. Yeah, right. Yep. And I remember we were watching those thinking, we could make music like this. Mm -hmm. We could make music that is so emotional and tells such an amazing story that it just touches people's hearts. What's interesting is last year, a couple of years ago, we put out a survey to our fans on social media and we asked them, why do you love music? And far and away, the answer was because it makes me feel something. Musicians that were already out there and the ones who really found success, there was kind of a common denominator with each of them is, is all of them had, had a shtick, had something about them that helped set them apart. And it's like, okay, like we know how to sing, like, you know, like we can wear a suit, but it's like, that wasn't enough for us. And so we tapped into our storytelling roots. It's like, you know what? We know how to tell a story. And that together with the visuals and with the music, we were able to position ourselves in a way that at least raised some awareness of us relatively quickly. I mean, I remember um, just one line that you used to say quite often was, every artist is selling something. You know, and so I think it's it's a beautiful thing that we chose to sell what we're selling. To dream. Well, this is uh, this has been a great day, guys. I uh, had a great show this afternoon. Uh, thank you for being such a fantastic audience tonight. Definitely a, a Christmas to remember, right? Not one we'll soon forget. Um, you know, and speaking of memories, this stage here at the Maverick Center actually plays kind of a, a critical role in our gentry history. We have a, a really cool memory here. This is actually the first stage that we ever stood and performed on and introduced ourselves to the world as gentry. And that was uh, about six years ago, almost to the day. Yeah. yeah. Time flies. Time flies. We're old, that's what that means. But, uh, and, and, and not to uh, forget that it's across the street from the old Hale Center Theater, which is where the three of us met doing a musical theater production just a few months before that. Well, we do have for all of you uh, one more surprise tonight. It's one that we're very, very excited about. We've been kind of keeping it under wraps for a little over a month now. And uh, we are excited to announce Gentry's return to the musical theater stage in the show that brought us together, Les Miserables. You know, we get asked a lot, like, uh, how did how did we come together and what was our relationship? Um, you know, the short answer is that we came together doing Les Mis seven years ago. Um, and that's true. It's the first thing that we had all done together. But we actually, we, we knew each other before Les Mis. Brad and I uh, met doing a show at the old Rogers Memorial Theater in Centerville, Utah. It's this little tiny theater in like a strip mall. And we did Beauty and the Beast together. Um, that was like before you served the mission. Like 2005. 2005. Yeah. I just got married and then you and I did Tell Two Cities. I remember sitting in music rehearsals and we were rehearsing, oh, remember this? Yes. And all of a sudden I hear this voice behind me. It's just like, ah! <laughs> and I'm like, what the, <laughs> who is that? <laughs> and it was Brad. That was me. I've coveted his voice ever since. <laughs> <laughs> super long hair. Yeah, that, like long, long flowing locks. Mm. <laughs> we all knew of each other or knew each other going into Les Mis, but it was it was throughout that process of doing, in my opinion, what is one of the most physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually taxing shows of all time. Yeah. Like you can't do a show without 
forming a, a really unique bond with, with cast members, particularly with characters that we play across from each other that they connect very frequently in the show, right? Marius and Andras and Valjean and Marius, like there's just this really unique chemistry on stage and it, it segued really naturally into kind of a brotherhood and, and a friendship off stage after the show as well. Yeah. We had just wrapped up a production of Les Miserables and uh, shortly after that, we found ourselves, well, two of us found themselves That's right. in a kitchen. Yeah. So I think it was literally like during the show, we had this idea. My, my wife looked at us while we were playing games and was like, you guys should form a group, a music group. And we're like, what, like a boy band? Yeah. And kind of laughed at her. And then uh, and then we started talking about it with this friend of ours who was visiting from LA and, and just, I don't know, it just kind of clicked. Well, she said like, you guys need to be a music group that stands for something. Right, you know, right. Like, and she was talking about her dating life. Yes. You know, and how she couldn't meet any good guys in LA, which obviously is not the case, but she just was having bad luck. <laughs> and, um, a and very she, traditional person. Right. Loves like traditional values and like old school courtesies and gentlemanly, you know, yeah. things. And so yeah, she was like, you guys should be like the man band. The man band. In fact, that was our, that was our working name for how long? <laughs> the man band. Before we had an actual name, it was yeah, just the man band. Like every other good idea, we consulted a woman because <laughs> we didn't have any good ideas. Tell, tell that story. <laughs> well, so we were trying to come up with a name for this group Originally, we thought like, okay, we'll go the musical theater route. We come from a theater background. So like the lead men mm -hmm. or I mean, any, any other like Broadway boys, names. the Broadway like boys. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'd gone back and forth. And like just about the time we thought something was good. We're like, nah, it doesn't quite click. And then one night I was brushing my teeth and I was expressing frustration to my wife about how like we just could not find the name. And we were confident once we found it, we would know and just almost nonchalantly. I don't even think she looked up from her phone. She was just like, well, why don't you just call it Gentry short for the gentleman trio? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I either like spit out toothpaste or dropped my toothbrush and just stared at her with this glare. Like, really? You're just going to come up with the name of the group like that? We should have started there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The very beginning when, when I was on board and we were planning out our future of what Gentry was going to be and how big we wanted this this to become, uh, I gave them three conditions that I didn't want to be in any music videos, I didn't want to be on stage, and I didn't want to tour. Um, all of that seemed like it was too much in the limelight, I didn't want cameras on me, uh, and I'm too shy for that kind of stuff, and turns out that did not stick. So I knew each of the guys individually um, before I started working with them. I knew Brad Robbins from BYU Young Ambassadors, uh, Bradley Quinn and I had the same vocal coach. And then Bradley Quinn introduced me to Casey when he needed me to play for him for just a quick side gig. And so I had briefly met him, but otherwise I didn't know that they all knew each other uh, or worked a lot with each other up until that point. So we had this idea to form the group. The next day I call Steven Nelson that Brad and I had like just worked with a few weeks earlier on a, on a concert. And I call him up like, Steven, hey, um, first of all, do you remember me? <laughs> Because we met that one time. And I was like, hey, we just had this crazy idea to start this music group. And I kind of told him about it. And there was like silence on the other line. Hey, we've got this idea. We want to start a boy band. And I was just like, how do I get out of this? Because I didn't get it at first. I somehow convinced him to meet with us. And so we met and then we agreed to do an arrangement of Till I Hear You Sing. Yes. Right? And um, he, later on, he told us that he was just thinking, how do I get rid of these guys? Can I just do one arrangement and then maybe they'll go away, fizzle out? <laughs> Before Gentry, I was gearing up to become a film composer and everything in my life was, was pushing towards that end. At the time I was working with uh, a few other artists uh, on smaller projects. And a lot of what I was doing was just to get me to that next step so that I can spend all my time film scoring. Hearing Gentry sing together for the first time was actually a shock for me because I wasn't planning on working with them long term. And I thought to myself, it's too bad that this isn't going to work out with these guys, which was not my plan, um, because they sound fantastic together. I think he was hooked. Like something clicked in his brain was like, mm. actually, this could work. <laughs> it could work. Yeah. His producer mind all of a sudden like kicked in and he, he got it. 
And of course, the next idea was to have a photo shoot, right? So nothing better than white pants, jackets, and sunglasses. Well, so we did the photo shoot because we wanted the logo on it. And all the caption was, was something's coming. We're like, oh, it'll be so intriguing. What's funny about that is like, we had no idea it was coming either. <laughs> well, we started getting messages from friends like, are you guys starting a clothing brand? Are you doing a modeling thing? Like, yes. what is this? They're like, uh, we'll let you know when we figure it out. <laughs> yep. But it was actually, it turned out to be actually, I think to our benefit because there was some intrigue around it and like, mm -hmm. what, is it, what are these guys doing? Um, and then I think our first release was uh, the cover of With or Without You and yep. mm -hmm. Every Every Breath You Take. and yep. Which was available to a limited number of people. And then we never formally released it. That's right. We should re-release that. If we can find it. I think we yeah. look for it. We can't find it. <laughs> but yes, we should release Steven's it again. Like, delete, 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 <laughs> delete. <laughs> After we formed the group, it was pretty critical that we discover what our sound was. Remember that? Mm -hmm. um, at first, we thought we were going to go the Broadway route and do only Broadway music. And then what happened? Well, we met with um, a gentleman named Bart Olson. And uh, Bart is with a local record label here in, in Salt Lake City called Shadow Mountain. And uh, we, we kind of pitched this idea of the group. Again, we had no name. We had headshots of each of us from our theater days. And I remember sitting down and saying, we want to do Broadway music. Yeah. And he's like, hmm, <laughs> okay. And then later on, he came back and he's like, so about the Broadway thing, I'm, I'm thinking maybe a little broader than that, like maybe appeal to a, little, a, a few more people. And so that's where we started to think, actually, maybe we could do Broadway stuff as well as write our own stuff mm -hmm. and cover popular songs. Well, at the same time though, we learned something about Steven, who we thought was a great accompanist and arranger, but we had no idea his uh, abilities in the world of orchestration. Yes. And at the time he was working on a project for another artist he was, he was composing or arranging for, and we listened to these tracks and we were just like, it was such an emotional experience. I'd yeah. forgotten about that. Yeah. The way that the music swelled, we were all just like, who is this guy? Yeah. <laughs> One of my f greatest loves in music is film scoring. I love the cinematic styling of, of piecing that whole sound together. When Gentry came along, I was excited uh, to be able to, to incorporate that style into their sound, which is not how Gentry started out. The, the plan for Gentry at the beginning was to be a completely different musical sound. It was only after we kind of workshopped that a little while until we realized that that wasn't working and that we needed to find something else. We eventually came up with cinematic pop and then the rest is history. Uh, the fusion of cinematic styling of orchestrations and uh, the contemporary stylings of the three-part harmonies coming together. Yeah. Well, and, and it was a natural fit too because, you know, in, in a Broadway show, whether it's to a track or a live orchestra, like there is that orchestral feel. So it didn't yeah. feel foreign to us to, to bring in these orchestral elements. It still felt like we could be believable and authentic performing with an orchestra that, that the, you know, the volume and, and kind of girth of our vocal sound like lended itself to a big orchestra and together it was it was a good fit and i think one of the reasons we loved that orchestrated big sound and also the broadway music style was because we're able to tell stories totally. having steven uh have that unique gift to be able to orchestrate beautiful sweeping tracks and music is just it's amazing eventually it, it turned out to be a really good thing that i stuck out a little bit longer because once we came up with cinematic pop and then my background in film scoring and all of the great contemporary stylings they have vocally coming together that that's when i saw the vision and i got really excited and then from that point on film scoring has kind of been out the window and then life as we know it now as i know it now has has been what it's turned out to be, which has been really fun. I actually, I realized when I uh, started working with Gentry that 
Maybe I didn't want a film score as much as I wanted to work with orchestras, and it gave me the perfect opportunity to do that. I think I can safely say that my favorite part of Gentry is the Christmas shows and the Christmas touring. There's something special about Christmas music, and there's something uh, special about when, when you bring all of that together and then an audience who has so much history with those same songs, but our own kind of twist on those arrangements. Um, it, it's fun to see their faces light up and to see the tears in their eyes or to have them feel so much excitement as they're getting into the music. Uh, that never gets old to me. So as exciting as the rest of this is, Christmas definitely holds the most special place in my heart. We released a Christmas album pretty early on, I think 2016. Mm -hmm. um, actually, we released two albums that year. Yeah, that I think of it. it's all kind of a blur. Um, so two albums, the second one was a Christmas album, and we thought to ourselves, like, the the best hall at that time in Salt Lake City was a Bravenel Hall. It's where the symphony plays, and we're all like the, you know, the classiest artists come to mm -hmm. perform. And so we thought, <laughs> gosh, wouldn't it be amazing to do a Christmas show there? And so we kind of just, on a hope and a prayer, um, booked it. And we're working with somebody to help us kind of uh, produce it. And we were so blown away and grateful that first year that it sold out. And I think that was maybe the first time, it was early enough on in our in our journey that we thought, wow, people people like this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and that performance, if I remember correctly, the fire alarm went off. <laughs> right before act two. Right before act two or yeah. intermission yeah. in this case. <laughs> it sure did. All the haze we were, we were yes. using. So first big Christmas show, first big fiasco, and it turned out beautiful. Every year after that, we decided, man, we, we love doing Christmas so much. And I think I think just personally, we love performing Christmas music. And the fact that people wanted to, to pay to come see it was a plus. But it's like, we want to keep this tradition going. And so we were able to move from Ravenel over to the beautiful new Eccles Theater downtown. And every year since, it's become Gentry's home for Christmas. And we've grown that from, from one show to multiple shows. And I think the coolest messages we get every year are people who we had no idea even knew about it or that they even wanted to come send us texts after the show and be like, this is my family's new Christmas tradition and we won't miss it. And I think one of the reasons um, that Gentry lends itself to Christmas and the tradition of Christmas and the epicness of some of these orchestrations that Stephen has developed is because we're able to truly connect to our our authentic selves and our beliefs in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a time where a lot of people are thinking about the Savior and it's just, it's meaningful, even more meaningful than the rest of the year. One of the things we found with Gentry is that we're, we've been the most successful when we're just authentic to who we are, mm -hmm. you know? And like you said, we, we all have a firm testimony of Jesus Christ. And so Christmas is just a natural way for us to really share our hearts and open up our souls. And I think that's one of the reasons why it, it's done well for us and it connects with people. We had built up this Christmas tradition and we were touring all over the country. Things continued to pick up. We were, you know, I think we recorded and released a couple of albums independent from any record label. Mm -hmm. We were producing a number of videos. We had just wrapped up our first international tour over in Europe. And then just like that, everything stopped. The world is faced with a global pandemic um, and all of a sudden getting people together was no longer possible and the gentry world suddenly looked a lot different. And then we got a phone call uh, from our dear friend Tammy Morgan. You guys remember that? From Hale Center Theater saying, hey, what are you doing? Uh, not much. <laughs> <laughs> you want to come back and reprise your roles in Les Mis? Les Mis is recognized worldwide as the king daddy of all musical theater. I mean, there is nothing like it. It's, it's on a pedestal all of its own. If you're a theater producer, uh, like we are, you're asking when can we get Les Mis, you know, every six months or so, at least <laughs> once a year. 
and knowing that that's laughable and you're not going to get it because when a show is conceived, if it's a major hit, the national tours are going to grab it. It's going to stay in London. It's going to stay in New York uh, consistently for a long, long time. And, and they don't want to uh, dilute the power of that in any way. And so they don't get it out there. When I was in high school, Les Mis was the show, right? I mean, it was what we were all listening to. It was what we were all singing. And I remember also auditioning for the for the touring company when they came through Salt Lake uh, back in my Marius days and uh, not even getting, you know, past that first filter. But I didn't care because it was Les Mis and here we were and it was awesome. So when they announced that we were doing it originally back in 14, I'm like, please choose me, please choose me. And then when they called me, it was like, yes, yes, I get to do this show that I have wanted to do since I was a teenager. It is, it is one of my favorite shows that I've ever done. Our thoughts were our chances of getting lame is again, you know, trying to circumvent all of those national tours and everything was, you know, probably slim to none for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Last August, the tour for Les Mis was going to be canceled. I thought, okay, bad misfortune because of COVID. And I thought, but maybe good fortune for us. So I texted my contact in New York. I said, John, do we have a chance of getting Les Mis? And I got an immediate no. <laughs> so I, about five minutes later, though, I got this, if you could put it in the spring, there is a, a kind of a slim chance we might be able to make this work. Because of the global pandemic and Broadway being shut down and all the tours being shut down, no one in the world was doing Les Mis. And so because of the unique relationship Hell Senior Theater has with the publishers, they reached out kind of just on a whim mm-hmm. and said, hey, what are you guys doing with Les Mis right now? Uh, and they're like, nothing. We got express permission from uh, all the top dogs, from the owners, from everybody that, yes, Hale Center Theater could produce Les Mis during COVID time because hardly uh-huh. anyone else was producing full. Seven years later, a lot has changed. We're better. The theater is bigger. There are more opportunities. And part of me was worried, are we going to do it better? Or is it just going to be bigger? because I have such a a sacred place in my heart for that first production we did, right? I mean, uh, it was special. It was the best thing we had ever done. As soon as I started listening to auditions, I knew that this production would be even stronger than the last because the talent that was coming out, I mean, COVID was, it's like an attack on this art, an attack on singing, an attack on performing. And everybody was hungry hungry to get out there and to do this show that they love and it was a perfect storm because everyone came out for this show and um the show is magic and it's exactly what the world needed just the idea of being able to do les mis again was thrilling because the first time that we did it in west valley was in the round and to our knowledge no one had ever produced les mis in the round and the comments that we would get back from so many of the patrons was that they felt the emotion and the impact of this of this show more than any other time they'd seen it because they were so close. And so being able to put it in the round again here in this theater in Sandy was um, an exciting thing because this time we were going to be able to add stage technology and all the bells and whistles to make this story as unforgettable and as impactful as it could possibly be. For years, we've talked from stage about how Les Mis connected us originally. And yet, in a way, Les Mis again, seven years later, has reconnected us. Because over the last eight months, the amount of times we got together, we rehearsed, we toured, was dramatically different. So much more limited. And so in a way, this has been a great opportunity for us to literally be reconnected as the world opens up again as we're able to leave our homes and get back into the things that we love. And one of the most satisfying parts of doing the show with these guys has been doing it with, with the seven years of history that we have. You know, dying alongside BQ at the barricade and, and, and following his leadership, looking into Casey's eyes as he, you know, as Valjean becomes a changed man, 
it's totally different. And I was talking to someone just the other day who said it's a thrill to watch Gentry perform. And she had nothing, had nothing to do with her talent. She said, it's because I can see the brotherhood, the friendship and the authentic relationships that exist between you guys. And it totally translates through on stage. And, and I feel that and I love that. It's fun crossing paths backstage and it's like you're doing a show with your brothers. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun for me to see you in a wig. <laughs> hey, old man. Three wigs. Take this. <laughs>